चड्डा की हैं जो के दयाल सिंह कॉलेज इंग्लिश डिपार्टमेंट में एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर हैं जहां से मैं भी आया हूं और हमारी एसोसिएशन काफी पुरानी है तो इनके बारे में खास तौर पे तो मैं ये कह सकता हूं कि इनका इंट्रैक्शन लोकल दिल्ली बाकी स्टेट्स में और इंटरनेशनल लेवल पे चाहे वो पढ़ाने के इशू पे हो या सेमिनार्स के इंट्रैक्शन में हो वो काफ़ी मोबाइल हैं और इंट्रैक्शन में हमेशा हर एक जो सोसाइटीज़ का या किसी इंस्टीट्यूट का कोई फंक्शन होता है वहाँ पर इनकी इंटरवेंशंस रहती हैं सो एक्टिवली पार्टिसिपेट करती हैं सो इनका टॉपिक जो है वो श्रीलंकन पोइट्री से रिलेटेड है बिलोंगिंग बाय विक्टमाइजेशन एंड स्ट्रेंजर्स द पोइट्री ऑफ अगर ये फ्रेंच से है तो यहाँ अगर जी Wishing everybody a very good afternoon, especially to our esteemed guests. I'd just like to say I wish I could give this time to her falsa because it is so interesting to listen to me. Yeah. But so sorry. Now you have to listen to my boring paper, so you just have to make do with what I'm going to say. <laughs> Today I wish to draw your attention to questions of identity and violence in the war poetry of the Sri Lankan poet Jean Arasanya. Since she speaks of these categories, not as universals or meta-narratives, but within the very particular context of the war on her homeland, I will briefly dwell on the post-colonial, neo-colonial politics of the island nation of Sri Lanka, its impact on Jean's sense of self, and the transformative sensibility that she brings to our perception regarding the infallibility of racial or ethnic boundaries. I'm making that distinction. I'm not saying racial and ethnic at the same time. Also with the war in Ukraine, Jean's poetry is more pertinent now than ever before. And the question, why war poetry? When news channels, so social media networks are replete with updates on the war, is a question that I will endeavor to attend during the course of this presentation. Sri Lanka has been synonymous with violence. And until very recently, most of the news coverage from the island nation concerned bomb blasts and suicide bombings as executed by the LTT on the civil sec sections of the population. The LTT, or the London Tigers of China Millennium, a militant secessionist organization, <coughs> chose to make their demands heard through methods of extreme violence, thereby earning the adage terrorism. Terrorism refers to a form of guerrilla tactics, wherein the violence that is being enacted is random, it is sudden, it is brutal, and it is spectacular. It is spectacular so as to draw attention to the cause, which in, the, in this case was Tamil separatism. Also, terrorism is a term according to violence by non-state actors. Following independence of the declaration of Sinhala as official language and Buddhism as a state religion, the Tamil community in Sri Lanka found itself extremely marginalized, both economically and culturally. The majority perception was that this marginalization was the way to redress the balances of imperialism as it was felt that the community had enjoyed immense status and privilege under the colonizers. The demand for a separate Tamil nation, Elam, was enunciated first by the Tamil youth on the Jatma Peninsula as they found all future avenues blocked in terms of higher education or gainful employment. Jatna, unlike the fertile parts of southern Sri Lanka, is barren and agriculture is not an option. Under British imperialism and the spread of missionary education in Jaffna, the Tamil community became well conversant with the language and the culture of the rulers. Macaulay's minutes, of course, do apply, and found gainful employment under the colonial offices, which are in the capital city of Colombo. This facilitated what has been called the famous money order economy of Jaffna. Now, with home rule, however, what we see is the beginning or the heralding of a new form of nationalism, a new um, Sinhala consciousness, which was really a majoritarian Sinhala nationalism that staked a claim onto the island and its resources, thereby marginalizing my minorities who had for generations contributed to the progress of the island economy. The LDT sprung up from the fault lines created by the chauvinistic and very exclusive nationalism. Terms like ethnic conflict are often used to sum up the civil war that ensued 
but for me it is a term that obscures much more than it reveals. The irony is that prior to independence, Sri Lanka or Ceylon was the model colony of the British Empire. This was on, on account of the syncretic and the cosmopolitan culture that had developed there, due to multiple colonizations of course, by the Dutch 1505 to 1658, Portuguese 1658 to 1796, and the British 1796 to 1948. Testimony to this tolerant and multicultural ethos was the thriving Berber community of Sri Lanka, which was the result of the miscegenation between the European settlers and the indigenous people on the island. These were usually the Dutch Burgers, because by the time the English came, we more, more or less called them the Anglo-Indians. So the contribution of Burgers, especially Burger women, towards the education and the medical amenities on the island is well documented. And if anybody wants to, I would recommend Nilofa de Mel's book, Women and the Nation's Narrative. Following independence, however, discourses of ethnic purity and authenticity, authenticity that means ethnic authenticity, as demanded by the new nationalism, took center stage. As a result, hybridity, which is the Berber community, is a hybrid community. When I'm speaking of hybridity, I mean a racial hybridity, which is, the, which is how the term is employed. Otherwise, we call it a, a multiculturalism or a biculturalism. Hybridity, the term specifically re refers to racial hybridity, ethnic hybridity. So in this case, hybridity were the, the hybrids were the Burgers. As a result, hybridity was decried. And women from the burger community particularly were targeted as pol polluted and licentious. Now, as I told you all earlier, that these were the women who had brought the medical and the education first to the island. And now these were the ones who were being targeted. By contrast, this enabled the construction of the Sinhala women, women as ideals of purity, chastity, and authenticity. This being the desired national representation of the women of the newly independent nation. It is not surprising that this new nationalism had a lot of problems. Now you all must have heard of the Sigiriya rock sculptures of uh, Sri Lanka. They're very famous, they're famous world over. Now this new nationalism, the new uh, Sinhala consciousness, had a lot of problems with this uh, Sigiriya sculptures. Um, I, I will not go into the details. And um, so, now coming of age in post-colonial Sri Lanka, Arasanyagam's early poetry, as recorded in her collection, A Colonial Inheritance, and other poems, is replete with cultural nuances of both her Dutch heritage as well as the indigenous cultures that have shaped her sense of self and being. So she is at once the colonizer and the colonized. And what I really like about her poetry is that she is extremely critical of the exploitative nature of colonization and of her Dutch ancestors. Troubled by the alienating effects of the discourse of Bhumi Putra, now one of the uh, discourses that the Sinhala nationalism propagated was Bhumi Putra which is sons of the soil. And the constructiveness of an ideology that rendered her and her community liminal within the space of her homeland, Arasanyagam conveys her dissent and her rejection of this discourse through her poetry itself. It is within and through the poetic text that she carves out a rather enriching and empowered self-definition for her innate hybridity. She can't decry in her hybrid. Right? She's, she, there are two ethnicities, two races that are combined in her. She is Dutch and she is indigenous. But now this new discourse is saying that, oh God, you guys are really polluted because you are, you, you're not authentic and, and you're, not, you, you're not a monolith. You know, so. Uh, so she, now how, how does she turn this discourse around? I really like what she does here. Interestingly, she does this by drawing on mainstream Buddhist mythology itself. In a poem entitled Kindura, which he wrote in 1973, Jean uses the symbol of the Kindura, which is a mythological half-bird, half-human creature from the Buddhist le legend, Sanda Kindura Jatakaya. Buddhism now has a very revered place in the dominant imaginary, as it is the foundational myth linking the Sinhala race to the island. And this is drawn from the epic. The main epic of the island is the Mahabhamsa, uh, where the Buddha, deems that the Sinhalese are the protectors of the religion, of the faith, and the island is to be its future sanctuary. So that's how, you know, they, you link the, the, the religion and the ethnicity to the land. Now the Buddhist symbol of the Kindura provides Arasanyagam with an enabling and empower, empowering metaphor as the text below demonstrates. I'll just read three other poems. Feathers slice off your waist, tail, plumes play the air. Claws grasp the earth. And now the tone changes. You know, the first three lines are rather 
harsh, like as if somebody is slicing off something. And the feathers are flying. I mean, there's the aggression and there's violence in the first three lines. Like, feathers slice off you, like someone's foot. Like now it changes because now she's coming to the human. I mean, you're moving from the bird to the human. Fingers touch flute. Music twitters from those human lips. Your imperturbable profile does not suggest discrepancy of embodiment. Yet your folded wings, unruffled feathers, suggest an immobility of flight arrested. And I see my own submerged personality, a strange, restless ghost of Kindura. I wish I could explain, I wish I could go into uh, the poem, but I would. Uh, um, it is within the space of this poetic text and the ambivalence of meaning that it constructs that Jean finds a voice that is otherwise being denied to her in the neo-colonial discursive space of this new nation. Neither avian nor human, the Kimura is both. It is self-complete in its hybridity, usurping the sim symbol from mainstream culture to redefine hybridity. Arasan Yagam effectively relocates herself from the margins into the center. And through this poetic metaphor, to me, she appears like the many armed Durga. She subverts the hegemony. Now, there, there are also the expressions of immobility and flight arrested, and uh, they convey a certain tension. Uh, we'll explore that straight as we go along. Uh, then, Jean's marriage to Thyagraja Arasan Yagam adds another complex dimension to her persona. She now becomes a Sri Lankan Tamil Hindu. So she's a burger, Tamil, you know, she's added one more dimension to it. Another marginalized dimension. Nothing. Uh, now she's not only the foreigner, the alien, the colonizer, but she's also the insider outsider as well. And by being so, she's a potential target for the violence of the majoritarian nationalism, which is now targeting Tamil, Sri Lankan Tamil. It is at this point in the nation's history that the Sri Lankan public sphere underwent extreme militarization to the ex extent that the presence of violence, even in everyday banal matters, becomes so prevalent as to become naturalized and often goes unnoticed. Writing in the immediate aftermath of the anti tamil program of July 1983, often referred to as Black July in the nation's history, I'll just give you a little brief on Black July. Black July was a turning point in the history of Sri Lanka, following the state funeral of 13 Sinhala soldiers ambushed in Jaffna by the LTTE. Riots had erupted across the island with Colombo as the epicenter. The compliance of state functionaries in the massacre of innocent Tamils severed any vestiges of faith that the community may have placed in the state. After 83, Elam became a do or die cause for the young Tamil men and women who flocked to the headquarters of the LTT in Jaffa to train as carters. The Women's Brigade, the Ilawar, was formed after 1983. So writing in the wake of this, she writes a poem. Uh, the poem is entitled 1954, 71, 77, 81, 83. And she enunciates, it's all happened before and will happen again. And we, the onlookers, but now I'm in it. It's happening to me. At last, history has meaning. She's just been a riot victim. The jubilant exaltation of the lines, it's happening to me. At last, history has meaning. Are like the sudden dawning of an, of an epiphany, of an epiphany of at last belonging, and of not being a bystander to the nation's history. Ironically, this sense of belonging has been arrived at by being the targeted victim of ethnic violence herself. With the riots of 83, Jean and her family had to relocate to a refugee camp which had been set up in a school in Kandy for the riot victims. It is from this state of trauma that her revisioning occurs and brings forth this rather paradoxical emotion. Academic discourse on riots, riots like Bina Das, for example, Mirrors of Violence, Mehta and Chatterjee, dwell on the fragility of the normal, a fact that is amply demonstrated by the occurrence of a riot. I mean, we take our normal so much for granted, the normal for the now, how it shatters in a second in a riot. Likewise, issues of governmentality assume center stage in studies on riots. As this resorting to chaos, the chaos of the riot, illustrates the failure of governmentality, and likewise, the setting up of a refugee camp or refugee camps illustrates the reimposition of governmentality as the restoring of order or the ordering of the chaos of the riot. 
But clearly for Jean, it is the sense of belonging that this riot has conquered, even if it is in terms of victimhood that is paramount. Henceforth, she will negotiate her relationship with the new nation on a completely different praxis altogether. Following 83, Arasanyagam's poetic aesthetic completely changes. The earlier recourse to exotic mythological creatures disappears from the poetry, which now becomes a documentation and a witnessing of violence. The, for example, the title of the above mentioned poem, which I just read out, uh, it refers to the cyclic repetition of violence, like violence happened then, 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 and it's going to happen again. And it is not a singular reference to anti-Tamil violence, but she also, she makes a mention of two very important years, 71 and 81, which draw attention to the deadly and the lethal violence of the Sinhala political party, the JVP, the Janta Vimukti Peronima, onto civil society on the island. So she's not really using her voice only for the Tamils, you know, she, it's like an anti-violent stand that she's taking. Speaking of Jean's poetic aesthetic, Norman Sims has described it as a poetry that neither cringes before politics or its extension into civil war, nor deprives the victims of national catastrophe of their genuine groans and the silence of death. A poetry, in other words, that uses senseless words and figures of art to make into the illusion of senseless words <coughs> the things that otherwise belie the capacity of journalism, government reports, and fanatical propaganda to other people. While I agree with Sim's evaluation that unlike the factual information that is provided to us by news channels, the appeal of Arasan Yagam's poetry lies in the graphic pictures that she weaves, and she literally paints through words because they have an affective impact on us. But what Sims completely misses out is the transformative power of Jean's insights into violence, identity, and the nation state. Her, her, the ability of her poetry to move, to make us think anew, and to re-evaluate our possible beliefs. For example, in a poem, Eyewitness, Navala Pitya, a young boy speaks of carnage, eyewitness to death. From three streets, he says, they converged upon this township. They were without mercy in their killings. Hacked men as they ran from their burning buildings, flung into the fire with knives, great axe blades flashed. How can men walk through blood stained streets, flinging their weapons aside? See how they return to hold their children, fondle them, embrace their women, hold their heads, a plate of rice, bend their heads, and offer flowers at the temple? In texts such as these, Arasan Yagam conveys the disenfranchised community's sense of betrayal and even despair, while even she's according, though she's according dignity to the voices that are being silent. Yet hers, as I said before, hers is not a voice that is lent in support of the Tamil separatist cause. Uh, in fact, she's rather critical of the entity, and um, uh, in a poem entitled His Family, uh, composed after a visit to her husband's family home in Jaffna, uh, we see how we see her criticism of the entity. At the core of the text lies the serendipity of the past, juxtaposed against the present-day culture of death and dying that was being propagated by the entity nationalism. Mm -hmm. Bridegrooms of death that await the final consummation. Bridegrooms of death because the entity have this culture of death. You know, you, you wear the cyanide capsule, so um, you, 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 it's like you're marrying death. So they're bridegrooms of death. This fire in the streets for the Agni worshippers, they tread on ash. No sacred yamans left for them, garlanded three times to circumambulate. The bullets jam the Vedas, and the bows of epic heroes are in curved hand of a flung grenade. The sons of this family do not ride the chariots to battle in these new mythologies. Where then does the blame lie, if not with either of the warring sides? Who is to blame for this state of the answer again is to be found in Jean's Oubre itself, as the poem Innocent Victim Trincomale, Jean specifies. That's the last and the third poem, the last one that I'll read out, so I'll just take your patience. When they came, strangers, our house went up in flames, thrown in like faggots, my parents blazed, rattling. They burnt like two lizards in the fire. My sister too, she, tiny chameleon turned first green, then livid red. My house went up in flames. This is a child talking, the survivor. My house went up in flames, together with my sister, father, mother. Will they come again? Strangers. 
So she uses the word strangers for the violence. I mean, she's not using any ethnic marker here. The poignant images of unnatural death here suggest Normanson's analysis of Curtis and Latham's poetry. But her aesthetic goes well beyond Sims' assessment. It is this Hobbesian descent into violence and the discourse that legitimizes this violence that she deconstructs through these images. The violence is attributed to strangers, not to either of the two ethnicities, Tamil or Sinhala. Ethnic markers are completely absent from her text. It is not any particular ethnicity that she's condemning, but she's condemning this recourse to violence itself. The word stranger resonates with a multi multiplicity of meanings, suggesting man as a stranger to himself in a society that is thus militarized, also suggesting a nation which has become a stranger to itself because of its non-violent ethos of Buddhism. After all, Buddhism is a non-violent religion. Where Arasin Yadam's early poetry was concerned with the chasm between the temporal reconstructions of identity as unitary and essentialist and her lived existential reality, she has given expression to these through the damage to these multiple dimensions of her ethnicity through the image of the Tendura. Um, I'll just cut out a bit. Um, but then her idea and then as we see that later she goes on to the violence, her idea of violence extends beyond armed conflict to the violence of the refugee camp, the violence of alienation, the violence of gender norms being inflicted on bodies, and the violence of rewriting, the rewriting of history as per present day identity concerns. To conclude, I will say that it is the space of the poetic text that lies the space of Jean's insurgency, her rebellion, and herein lies Jean's unique aesthetic. It is an aesthetic that enabled her politics, an aesthetic that makes no room for narrow ethno-nationalist concerns. Also, uh, as a, a Palestinian author, Susan uh, Abul Hawa, in Memories of an Un-Palestinian Story, in a can of tuna, said when she was writing about the Palestinian violence, she said, so I, and I use the same with you, my stories are the stuff of my intifada, and every reader is part of my tribe. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Sinha. Beautifully presented and well conceived. So, मुझे एक दो जो चीजें समझ आई. Specifically, जो इस paper से जो निकली है. एक तो जो सिनाला और जाफ़ला का जो issue है. Tamils का उसमें problem जो है इन्होंने जो identify की है वो post colonial complexities है actually जो भी भी settle नहीं हुई और वो complexities ये है कि जब colonial period खत्म होता है तो उसके बाद एक nation state की बात आती है जो इन्होंने last में pointers दिए कि nation state जब हमारे पास एक category आएगी तो उसमें fit करने के लिए आप जब nationhood में एंटर करते हैं तो उसमें सिनाला मेजोरिटेरियन जो है वो जब एक्टिव होते हैं वो नेशनलिज्म एक्टिव होता है तो नेचुरली जो उसमें पेरिफेरी में है जो अदर एथनिसिटीज हैं उनके लिए एक फियर का माहौल बन जाता है या उनके लिए नैरेटिव जो है वो रिएक्शन का डिफरेंट हो जाता है उनको एक तर लगने लगता है हर जगह है अगर इंडिया में भी देखें तो इस चीज को पॉलिटिकली यूज भी किया गया आप पैरलर्स देख सकते हैं जहां जहां भी कॉलोनाइजेशन हुई और उसके बाद पोस्ट कॉलोनियल कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी हर जगह ही है इंडिया में आई इमीडिएटली जब पाकिस्तान बनता है तो एक पार्ट ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ इस्लाम जब अलग होता है तो उसके बाद ये माना गया कि यह ऑटोमेटिक हिंदू राष्ट्र हो जबकि ये नहीं हुआ और ना किया गया लेकिन उसके अंदर डिसकंटेंट पैदा करने के लिए एक तो स्टेट्स और थी जहां पर जो ए, कुछ फोर्सेस ने ये सिमिलर भी जैसे तमिल के साथ हुआ तो वो चीज इनकलकेट करने की कोशिश की कि आपके साथ ये हो सकता है फियर क्रिएट करने की कोशिश की तो ये जो इश्यूज हैं ये नेशन स्टेट वाले इशू में हो सकते हैं अगर आप इसको देखें कि इंडिया एज 
सिविलाइजेशनल स्टेट तो बहुत सारी चीजें इसमें खत्म होती है क्योंकि वो एक प्लोटलिस्टिक कॉन्टेक्स्ट बना है जिसमें सभी कुछ है अगर पुराना एक श्लोक है कि सद एकम बहुधा विपरा बदलती तो यहाँ सबके लिए स्पेस थी है और रहेगी यहाँ कभी ऐसी कंट्राडिक्शन नहीं आई कि अगर अलग अलग राज्य में चोलाज है या कहीं मराठा है कहीं और है उनमें सत्ता के लिए लड़ाई हुई लेकिन एथनिसिटी खत्म करने के लिए किसी का धर्म खत्म करने के लिए या किसी और तरह से उस सिविलाइजेशनल कॉन्टेक्स्ट को खत्म करने के लिए कभी लड़ाई नहीं हुई तो एक सूत्र जो अभी भी बचता है जिसमें जो अभी की अगर जियो पोलिटिकल बाउंड्रीज को छोड़ दें तो उसमें श्रीलंका इंक्लूड होता है उस भारत वर्ष में इसी टाइम पे जब श्रीलंका सेपरेट नहीं था तो उसमें इंक्लूड होता है तो वो एक सिविलाइजेशनल जो सिमिलैरिटी और एक कॉमनैलिटी है अगर वहां तक जाया जाए तो मुझे लगता है कि वो इस चीज को रिसॉल्व भी कर सकता है लेकिन डॉक्टर सिमरन के पेपर में इन चीजों को एक बार पोइट्री जो हमारे बेसिकली अब यूक्रेन के कॉन्टेक्स में भी आप सोच सकते हैं कि वहां भी कुछ ऐसा निकलेगा होगा कि रशिया एक सोवियत यूनियन के पुराने देश को दोबारा अगर कैप्चर करने की कोशिश कर रहा है कहता है कि नहीं करूंगा लेकिन वहां तक पहुंच ही गया है तो वो कहेगा ठीक है आप कुछ देर रख लेते हैं तो ये चीजें अगर उसमें आती हैं तो ये मुझे लगता है कि पूरा कॉन्टेक्स्ट जो इसमें पोइट्री में उनका है वहाँ के विक्टमाइजेशन का और वो वॉयस देने का कि वो क्यों हो रहा है उसके रीजन को जो है इन्होंने कोशिश की है उसमें फोरग्राउंड करने की कि कैसे जब नेशन अपने आइडियल्स को और नए सिरे से अपना एक नेशन का नैरेटिव प्रिपेयर करता है तो उसमें विमेन का या और चीज़ों को कैसे वो फोरग्राउंड करता है तो सेकेंड सेकेंडरी लेवल पे जो अदर एथनिसिटीज हैं तो उनको उस फियर में विक्टमाइजेशन जो है फील होती है सो आई थिंक नाउ इट्स ओपन फॉर द डिस्कशन एंड Yes, Dr. Sivra, thank you very much. Congratulations on a well-developed paper on the belonging and victimization. Uh, it's such a shame that uh, probably many of us are not aware of Jean Arsenaidam. Probably outside the English academic community, uh, probably such a such a poetry and such literature might throw light on the various things like identity and displacement and a few issues of space and uh, uh, space and other things. I just would like to know what is the standing of Jin Arsenaidam in uh, popular Sri Lankan uh, consciousness? What? How does she, you know, figure out figure? Uh, maybe would you like would like me to complete and then? Oh, I'll check you. Uh, my, uh, yeah. Uh, one second one is you know see there is this issue of uh, uh, epithets and adjectives that go with communities, religions, and pol politics and uh, ethnicities. Actually, you know, there is no point in basking in the past and fictitious glory. It simply matters how does one treat the other at a given time. And we see those wounds in the Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan psyche. Not only Sri Lankan psyche, but also humanities. It affects humanity. Probably that is where the poetry of Vijay Arsenaigam, you know, springs forth and uh, you know, throws some light on that. Uh, a little question on your title for me. How do you connect this title? I don't know. Uh, see, the thing is, victimization springs from, uh, rather, gives rise to the othering, uh, victimization, violence, and uh, uh, belonging is the opposite, or the other, uh, other end of that spectrum. How do you connect into that? I know you are, you are trying to bring in this strangers or strangersness, if I may call. Okay, but how do you? Uh, what's in your mind, if I may ask you? <coughs> Which one should I answer first? Uh, you could go with the stand, uh, standing in the popular consciousness. Okay, Jean's um, standing in the popular consciousness. Now, um, let's see, uh, to address that question, to give it a um, befitting answer, it's a long way, uh, answer. Uh, Jean now um, is very popular in Canada, very popular in the West. Um, you're aware of Benedict Anderson, right? Yeah, yeah. Imagine, yeah, communities. imagine more communities. Now, what's happening here? How is this community being imagined as a nation? Mm -hmm. You'll find us alone. 
When Ceylon becomes Sri Lanka, what happens to the national imaginary? It's an imaginary based on numbers, not on anything else. Mm. So we're really going, we're really going beyond Anderson. You know, mm. when when Anderson uses certain parameters to define a nation as an imagined community, mm. it's not happening here because of democracy, because democracy is based on numbers. Now, there is this really chauvinistic Sinhala consciousness that is ascribed, mm. which is self-fashioning the new nation. Yeah. Now, with this similar consciousness, Jean is obviously on the, but they can't ignore her because she's very popular abroad, amazingly popular in the West. It was really sad. I mean, but a, a very brave woman. I, I met her a couple of times uh, in Jaipur and in Delhi, and I used to correspond with her. But I was quite young when I started this thesis. Internet was not like this. I couldn't get poetry. I couldn't get things on the net. And the letters that we used to write with each other were concerned more, instead of speaking to me about the, or me questioning her on the Sri Lankan situation, you know, we used to take it on a more personal note. But what was really sad was that Sri Lanka never recognized her as a Sri Lankan poet until 2017, which is literally a year before she died when she got the Operation Prize. You know, in, in fact, um, now, okay, see, again, I mean, you're not, when I say Sri Lanka, it doesn't mean everybody there is bad. You know, you have academics like Reggie Reg Sikhapalpane, who would immediately, obviously, uh, take a stand against the Sinhala nationalism. But we can't deny that the Sinhala nationalism was very strong, it was very majoritarian, it was very, very monolith. And they said that there's no space in this nation for anyone who is not Sinhala. The burger, there was a major burger exodus in 1957. She stayed back. You know, she stayed back. Obviously, I guess a lot of other burgers also must have. And um, she was denied recognition. To a large extent, she used to teach in a college in Kandy. She was a very popular teacher. Uh, her poetry was read. I mean, India has had this impasse with Sri Lanka. Our diplomatic relationships have been strained ever since Rajiv Gandhi's assassination. So no literature was coming in. Nothing was really, you know, we won't acknowledge even any news from Sri Lanka. But even in Sri Lanka, even in the national space of Sri Lanka, uh, her position was fraught. And in 2017, she finally got the highest award. And apparently, how I, what I heard about it was, uh, she was quite ill at that time when she went to receive it. She was so excited and so happy. She threw up a walking stick and literally ran to the stage. And she didn't survive much longer after that. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sundar Chanda, for the wonderful paper. Because uh, every articulation is, you know, is academic articulation or anything is, uh, you know, rooted in a context. And, uh, context of today, today's context, because uh, uh, I'm not uh, one no, most interesting power of poetry is that if it is a true art, if it is a true kind of, if uh, it is written with a proper kind of intention, it avoids judgmental comments, particularly in the case of violence. Because the judgmental comments in uh, violence actually, uh, actually uh, creates authorization, allegation, and nothing else. So, James poetry, one important power is that uh, poetry let us feel the pain which finally is a, a violence left the pain. Uh, we can, we can connect it with the pain of Gandhari after the great war of Mahabharata. It's not, you know, taking allegation to each other, but it's the huge amount of pain. And also a kind of existential crisis. I'm telling you yeah, because uh, the uh, student of Chile, Ashoka, uh, Andagama, and uh, the important filmmakers, young filmmakers of today. In their films, we find a very interesting film. It's 
a sad thing rather that is this perpetual state of violence in which they are invaded for decades. Yeah. Yeah. That creates a sense of uh, uh, alienation and you know, you know, aesthetic uh, mockingness. Right. That we find sometimes in uh, the uh, writings of uh, uh, Kashmiri poets and writers where the violence is particularly laid down for decades. Kind of certain kind of uh, alienation and alien uh, sense of uh, existential crisis. Did, did, did you find uh, something in uh, these poets? Kind of things. An existential crisis. Yeah. Kind of alienation. A sense of know. alienation. Yeah. Yes, I think she's combating with it all the time. That's why she uses symbols like Kindura. No? I mean, uh, she always, and in another poetry, she says, My eyes look into yours, and I know I cannot belong. And uh, then it's doubled because when she gets married into a Tamil Hindu family, she feels that even there, uh, they are not accepting her. See, there's a dominant discourse against Burger women because they are now seen as polluted. So there is, of course, there's this constant struggle with wanting to belong, be a part of this. But the difference that I would say with the Kashmiri poets is the few that I've read, or the Kashmiri narratives that I've read, Bashalat Peer, uh, okay, not Bashalat Peer so much, but um, the collaborator, uh, Mirza Vahid, Mirza Vahid, now he's also a contemporary. Uh, what I found, there is a, see that sense of homeland is fraught. They don't, see, they see Kashmir as a homeland, really, even there. They may not say it openly because like, like you said, that will be propaganda. But we all know that writing and writing, I mean literary writing, like Bhaktin said, it doesn't always have to be straight, right? Or, or like the Latin American writers, why are they using magic realism? Because they want to say something which they can't say straight, they'll be called propaganda. He doesn't use that. So I, hers is different from other writings on violence. And for her, Sri Lanka is very much her homeland. I mean, she's very sure about one thing, that they, this discourse which they are propagating is wrong. That's what I find coming through very strongly in her poetry, that this modern day discourse which they are propagating of Sinhala nationalism is a wrong discourse, of a unitary form of nationalism. And this is my homeland, and she sort of wants to tell them. She sort of wants to, you know, she's a teacher after all. She wants to teach them that you're wrong, and this is how you should stand corrected. That's what I think. Yes, sir. I'm just curious to know that the uh, regime uh, seems to concentrate on political violence most of the time. Is there some kind of uh, awareness of other kind of violence in life consumer poetry, like domestic violence or the violence which moves from the powerless to the power, opposite kind of violence? Is there some kind of uh, recognition of that also? Yes, 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 there is. I uh, <coughs> couldn't, you know, this paper was uncertain, but um, uh, yes, gender violence and uh, the, the violence of the Dutch. Violence of identity. Yeah, she does look at. In fact, quite uh, strongly, she looks at those. In fact, she even looks at the violence of the rewriting of history, because as regimes change, they will rewrite history. That's the violence too. We still have the time if anyone can. Uh, you didn't answer my one, the last one yeah, question. Yeah, I also remember yeah. there was one question. <laughs> 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 that was a complex one. That's why I did it. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, that was about the title. Okay. Actually, you know, I gave this title. I'll try and justify it. But by the time I wrote my paper, my title changed, and it is like a many armed Durga: identity and violence in the poetry of Jina Sanyapa. For the early title, I'll tell you, uh, yes, victimization and belonging, I just took it from that poem. Because she's a victim of the 83 riots. But then she says, now I belong. History is happening to me. So her sense of belonging. Like, oh, even if I'm, because it's only happening to somebody who will be part of this land, who they don't want, so I belong. 
which is a very contorted way of looking at it. And strangers, how I used was, I put it in uh, inverted commas, open and close, because she blames the violence not on any ethnicity. Strangers, they're strangers. Look at it under de uh, Deridian deconstruction. Strangers has many meanings. Yeah, yeah. Even the land is a stranger to its whole self. So that's how I use it. Thank you. Is that all? So we finished. Dr. Kodam, you want to comment anything? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were talking to him that you want to make two points. Like no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I really, for me, it was a very good thing. So I'll just tell you what I learned. And you can tell me whether I understood correctly. Please go ahead. So, so one, I think, which kind of two things struck me. One was this whole, that whole hybridization that you talked about, right? Uh, and how through poetry she is kind of... Uh, I don't know you know, you know, subverting the hegemony. I think that kind of struck that struck a thought to me. And the second is of course the strangers, this whole you know, that there is no ethnic marker to it. It's it's again like it's against humanity and there is anyone who is being violent is, is a stranger. So these are the two things I kind of picked up from your paper. <laughs> so I really like it. I think more people can uh, speak about her presentation, her choice of words and her diction and all that. So don't <laughs> appreciation mein itni ka juicy nahi karna. One word that has used is epiphany. Right? Epiphany is a manifestation. Sudden kind of revelation which breaks all the existing paradigms. Right? And it is a revelation which is completely new. Completely new. Completely new. New. Unexperienced. Absolutely unexperienced. That moment you can uh, uh, please elaborate that moment. Okay. Um, epiphany. Epiphany coming from James Joyce's use of epiphany. Um, that was my. But that, that is not in uh, Greek. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm more familiar with the Joycean, uh, so uh, like the Joycean idea of the epiphany and how he uses it. And so in this case, I felt like after all, see, suppose you are in a riot, you and your family are going to be hacked to death. They've come with access to cut your neck and throw you in the flaming house and you're running for your life. What are the things that will come to you? I hate these people, what a nation. Let me quickly try and get immigration to some other nation. <laughs> You know, but what comes to her? That as a burger, she was a bystander. Nobody used to attack burgers. You know, they used to just say, like, stand back, let us kill the Tamils. <laughs> but now she's a Tamil and they're killing her. And so she says it's an epiphany. Like, sudden realization, oh, I'm also, I belong. I found that very paradoxical. I have never read anything like that from a riot victim. These are Maximumers. Well, first they came for, you know, Jews. Yeah. Ah, yeah. 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 I think she should name also name start name writing name poetry. Name. <laughs> <laughs> and then next, Professor Arpan Singh uh, First of all, I beg to be excused for poking my nose almost in every book. Uh, I have nothing to say about the paper, but still, I need to say two things. First is, I want to compliment uh, Mr. Simran for the fluency of uh, for her fluency in Queen's English. Her felicity of language, rather her felicity of content-filled expression is really, uh, yes. really appreciated. Yes, yes. I am bound over. Two minutes more. Some criticisms, please. 
It was precisely for the richness of culture of Siloam that Guru Nanak thought of visiting Siloam, that he went to far flung areas from the interior Himalayas to the deep south and then to the Central Asia and by ship he went to Sri Lanka and it was rumored in Punjab that Guru Nanak wrote something and that manuscript lies somewhere in Sri Lanka and uh, the, um, monument, uh, the manuscript is, was known as Pran Sangli. When Guru Arjan compiled the Adi Granth because he didn't want even a single verse of Guru Nanak left out of the scripture. He sent his men to Sri Lanka, Guru Arjan, again by ship to see for themselves and bring a copy of that and examine that um, uh, uh, manuscript of Pran Sangli. And when Guru Arjan was satisfied that there, that uh, work doesn't contain anything of Guru Nanak, only then he went ahead with the compilation of the Granth. Uh, this I uh, only said by way of um, connecting it with the Sikh history and culture and scripture. And finally, again, I compliment Professor Simran Simra for the excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, Professor Arspal Singh is a final word to him. Who can he? Or we like that I'm being complete to get. Aaj ki presentation shayad last thing. Yes. So, aap sabhi associates ne aur fellows ne isme participation ki swal puche aur apni tipniyan de di. Iske liye aap sabhi ka dhanyaba aur presenters ka mubarak baat unho ne achhi tarah se apne jo prashn the unke baare me apna hypothesis aur apni jo hai vichar aapke samne rakhe. आप सभी का बहुत धन्यवाद।